thank you so much. First of all, it really feels great. Like this morning, I was first up on stage, and tonight I get to be last on the stage. That's really cool. Thanks that you're all still here for the last session. Uh, no, not the last session, uh, but my last session. Uh, so. Uh, what I want to talk about a little is about yeah distributed data. So we talk a lot about persistence. We talk a lot about how to store different data sets. So for example, when we had the Smack workshop today, we had a lot of discussions about what are like the best data models uh, to fix and uh, where to store my data. And uh, usually this talk uh, would have m mainly been given by Max from ArangoDB because we're going to be talking about ArangoDB. Uh, he unfortunately couldn't make it, and he asked me to do it. And ArangoDB is one of those exceptions where I'm actually more than willing to do it, because they have been really great partners around Mesos uh, for a long time. So they really helped us implement the persistent volumes. They really helped us to always test new Mesos features as kind of first uh, guinea pigs with their framework. So uh, this is why I'm standing here today and not Max. Um, so Max, he is a senior software architect at uh, ArangoDB. He mostly wrote uh, the data center to data center replication we will look at here right now. Uh, and I, as I was introduced, I'm a distributed systems engineer at uh, Mesosphere. Why distributed data? So as we are distributing our infrastructure, and this is kind of the promise of Apache Mesos, we also have to distribute our data. So. As we're scaling, and this is kind of one of the reasons why we need so many, so many large clusters, is that we have a lot of web cloud applications. Look at Twitter, look at Netflix, which are actually generating data. And uh, one of the realizations was that those exact, uh, existing monolithic systems, may it be a large SAP instance, may it be a large Oracle instance, do not really scope well and do not scale well uh, to this kind of workloads. And this is why we actually seen that many of the companies, large companies like Facebook, uh, have been developing their own solutions for storing data in a distributed fashion. And yeah, this is basically the realization that those new tools which uh, those companies have been developing, they're actually not on a single box. So what they try to do is basically uh, actually have different data models. Because if I have a traditional relational database, uh, whenever I scale that, I'll probably hit certain limits. And usually the guarantees which a relational data store gives me, they're really great, but they're also restricting the model in some kind of way. So uh, those big relational databases have been made for a different era. Don't understand me wrong. We still need relational databases, but we might not only need relational databases. We might want to talk about different uh, data stores as well. And the clipper doesn't quite work. Um, so this is why we actually nowadays talk about uh, so-called multi-model databases. And what does it actually mean? I can have different models for my uh, data. I can store it, for example, in a relational database. I can store it in a graph store. And whatever is popping up here, uh, we'll see that in a second. Uh, I can store it as a graph. I can store it in a document store. And all those data models, they have their valid use cases. If I'm restricted to my only relational database, what I have to do is I have to map all of those different data models to a relational model, meaning I have to break up my JSON, um, I have to uh, break up my key values and generate like a very simple relation for that. Uh, and also my graph, there are multiple ways of representing graphs in relational databases, but usually they're rather inefficient. So it doesn't actually scale out uh, in the way we would need it for this new era of web applications. And also those traditional databases, as I were single node instances, usually they haven't been designed with too much resilience in mind or automatic failover uh, that they can actually deal with uh, failing tasks. And I'm just going to see why my, uh, OK, why this keeps on popping up. And this is exactly uh, if I'm a database vendor and I have to write my distributed database, I usually I want to focus on something as yeah, data storing. 
da being a database. And all those new requirements that I actually be able to spread out across a large cluster, that I have to be able to detect failures, that I have to restart, and so on and so on. This is really more an annoyance because it's not my core business I want to focus on. And this is why RangoDB was one of the first to actually write their own really impressive Mesos framework and uh, following this approach of integrating in uh, kind of orchestration tools which don't require any more that I implement everything by myself. So, as mentioned, ArangoDB, it's a native multi-model database, meaning I can store JSON data in a native uh, representation, and I can store graph data in a native representation, and also key value uh, data. Uh, all of these I can actually store, and I can interlink. So, for example, I could have a graph where each node is actually a JSON document. Uh, and that makes actually then also querying all those, this distributed structure rather nicely. They have their own query uh, language to enable that, um, to query across all those different models. And they're actually quite scalable. So they can, all of this can run in a distributed fashion. And I can actually also query across distributed graphs. If we look at a model, and maybe this helps us to understand a little better why we actually need those different models. In a relational world, uh, my tables look here as on the, uh, as on the le uh, left here, uh, where I have like columns of data, and each column has like the same data type. I also can have something like graphs, where I have connections between certain entities. And maybe the last thing, if we talk about different values, uh, is then uh, here talking about a document structure. So a document structure, it might look similar to the relational structure on the left, but it's different in that way that actually the schema of each document can be quite different. So whereas in a relational model, I really have the same schema for each row, uh, in a document, I have a quite different schema for each of the documents, which could be rows in that document. And so this is actually why different models make sense. And we could talk about the other ones, like time series, uh, which is really good if I have a lot of sensor data, which looks very similar. Columnar data stores, if I really have repeating uh, same data value and I want to have aggregate queries across a certain column. Um, or key value stores, if I have a very simple representation. Uh, but all of them, they have the use cases, and they're uh, helping me to natively match my data to my data store. Because otherwise, if I all have to match it into one data store, I always have to rewrite data, which first of all adds logic. And secondly, it adds a lot of complexity to my data store and usually duplicates data. So the native approach is uh, for RangoDB to take uh, both documents or documents, graphs, and key value stores and all put it in like one big database, make it available via one query language and one deployment artifact. So I don't have to install a document database plus a graph database plus a key value store and then have queries in between them. I can query them all in a similar cohesive fashion. How, how does it look uh, if I deploy that? And we'll see how that looks on DCOS in just a second. So uh, I have DB servers, which are really uh, responsible for storing the data. And then I have coordinators, which are responsible for coordinating uh, those queries across all nodes. So I can have multiple coordinators and a number of DB servers. And this is the way we can scale. A coordinator has certain overhead for running a query. So if I see that my query workload is going down, I can deploy more coordinators. If uh, my storage space is running out or my compute capacity, I usually would add more DB servers. There is an agency. Um, with agency, you can also replace it in your head with Zookeeper or etcd, but it's their own implementation. Uh, which helps to coordinate all this. So you still need distributed system. You still need some kind of uh, majority decisions and uh, overall way to persistently store certain decisions. So for example, where data is stored or who's responsible right now, who's owning that data. So as we've seen on this slide, this is a distributed setup. Even deploying that on Mesos, whereas Mesos makes it already much, much simpler of writing something like that, um, 
it makes it much easier. It's still very challenging. So especially getting the scheduling logic right. So where do you want to deploy which task? And what do you do in certain failure scenarios? Failure scenarios, they are rather easy if we're talking about stateless services, because if my Nginx container fails, I'll usually just restart it. Great. But if my ArangoDB database server fails, I actually need to recover data. And uh, I need to make sure that my replica number of replicas is co uh, consistent again. And so the first iteration of this ArangoDB framework consisted of over 5,000 lines of C++ code. And with that number, just keep in mind, that was the first implementation of a framework really using uh, persistent volumes and uh, reservations in Mesos. So it also took us some time to really experience uh, or get a feeling for how it uh, should be used. So probably if we would rewrite it from scratch, it would be a little smaller by now, but still in the orders of thousand lines of code. So uh, what this framework does, it handles deployments, it deals with persistent volumes and uh, reservations, and uh, does take care of failover, and it also enables uh, up and scaling down, which uh, I personally like a lot. Then, just to give you a feeling for how complex this uh, framework is, so this is the state diagram uh, for creating reservations. So if you want to create a new persistent volume, you first you try to reserve, and uh, once you have reserved, you try to persist, and so on and so on. And at each layer, it might actually fail. So only the way to get a real reservation uh, to get a persistent volume, which can be used by the framework, uh, actually requires rather complex code here. And this is, as mentioned this morning, this is exactly the idea for the DCOS SDK, because this pattern is actually it's the same for almost any framework who, which wants to use persistent volumes. They all have to go through the same pattern. So the idea for the DCOS SDK is to kind of pull out uh, this logic and make it available as a library or as a, as a generator. Um, and if you're using the defaults, so if, you, if that's exactly what you want, you actually only have to write your YAML, similar to writing a Docker Compose file. You don't have to write any real Java code, and you also don't have to be an app expert. You simply say, I want to have n uh, number of database servers up and running. If you need custom failover logic, or in case of a RangoDB, custom logic to scale up and scale down, um, you might need to write a little code. So you can still use your overall YAML uh, to generate your scheduler, but you might override certain parts with your own custom logic. So for example, for scaling down, and this isn't yet implemented in the uh, SDK. This is one for them, one of the biggest uh, missing steps, uh, which they can't get working on the SDK yet, is the uh, process of scaling down. If I'm scaling down a, uh, a stateful service, I actually have to make sure that I make migrate the data first. So I first have to clear out the database server. I have to move the data somewhere else. Uh, and once the server is empty, there are no connections, no data anymore, or no data which needs to be replicated, I can then shut it down. Uh, ArangoDB has that implemented for their uh, own framework, but uh, this is not yet easy uh, with the SDK, so we felt we have to write a, would have to write a lot of code if we wanted to implement that in the SDK. Um, and so for now, ArangoDB is actually still down here using their own scheduler, but they're really trying to move up the stack because it simplifies things. So as said, for now, and also they started before the SDK was around, they have their own scheduler. As soon as we feel it has enough yeah, production quality similar to the existing framework, uh, they will probably move up uh, the stack here. Replication. So even though uh, we support failover by uh, having persistent volumes, by being able to shut down an individual database server here, this still will fail if an entire data center is failing. So a common problem is how can we actually replicate data across two data centers? And uh, so we have different options for that. Uh, the first one, or the 
yeah, the first level is simply to use a replication as an offsite backup. So I simply I create a database uh, dump every every hour and I write it to an external data center. This is one option and one goal, basically have an offsite backup of my data. The second one could be uh, for disaster recovery, which actually would mean that my second secondary data center can take over that workload uh, if it needs to. And the last level and the most complicated one is actually to have two active data centers, which can then also be used for ge geolocation, uh, meaning um, I can actually get requests to both data centers. So if we look down here, uh, the first approach basically means dump your data to the remote data center somewhere else. The second approach means you have exactly this picture where you have requests coming to one data center, but if that data center fails, you can actually, via a load balancer, via some kind of switch, uh, redirect the request to the second cluster, and there might be a small lag, some minimal data might have been lost, but uh, the applications can keep on running as before. Um, in the first implementation uh, for RangoDB, what they focused on is the first two parts. As mentioned, offering geolocation services, this actually requires two-way communication and two-way synchronization uh, with the clusters, because all of a sudden you have two uh, maskers uh, up and running which can both accept uh, requests. So for now, they simply decided is to have a secondary cluster as a fallback, um, and but only you can only send requests and write to one of the clusters at at the same time. So um, for this first iteration, the goal is actually to run database uh, clusters in both data centers or in more if you want to, but uh, the current customers are doing it in two, and then replicate data automatically between them. And uh, one one of the data centers fails they can switch over. So this is the goal of uh, what we are presenting here today. Uh, the V1 application is uh, to basically take uh, the default ArangoDB clusters, including all user settings, and replicate them to the other data center. And they actually already have an existing replication API called Arango Sync, uh, which used to be to sync clusters if you restarted uh, or you wanted to switch between different versions, for example, uh, that tool was used. And what that actually does in this new scenario, it uses Kafka on both sides. And Arango Sync on the one side will write all changes into the Kafka queue, and on the other side, uh, the other Arango Sync will read it out of it and apply it to the other cluster. Um, and using Kafka there has multiple advantages. First of all, we can also handle spike workloads in data center A. So data center A being the active one. So and if at some point the workload gets too much, a Rango Sync can still dump it, but it's just too quick to apply it in real time on the other cluster. Actually, Kafka can serve as kind of a buffer and help us uh, reduce that risk of losing data. And also, Kafka already comes with uh, between data center replication. So uh, it's helpful uh, because it's already been tested between different data centers. Uh, and similarly, uh, as we see spike workloads, in general, it, it helps to distribute the pressure because it can uh, also give me back pressure to the other side. And uh, important for uh, advanced setup is I actually have an encrypted uh, communication between the clusters. So I'm not sending any unencrypted, se potentially sensitive information across the internet. So uh, this is basically then how it looks like. So I have here a Rango sync, uh, which is uh, aware of each other, and it basically uses uh, Kafka underneath to synchronize uh, that data. So in data center A, Data center A usually being the uh, active one, it writes the data into uh, it dumps the data into wire Arango Sync into the Kafka queue, and the Kafka queue on the other side will read it. Arango Sync will then apply it to the database servers, uh, and the second cluster is then up to date uh, with the first one. 
in the first uh, v1 implementation, this is asynchronous. So uh, if data is written here, it's not immediately applied here. And if I have a transaction, for example, a user writing data, the user will be told your data is written before it's necessarily synced to the second data center. And uh, this mostly has to do with the overhead, because Kafka adds a certain latency, and it would really reduce uh, the performance of a Wrangler DB if they would be waiting for each, each of those events to be sung. And secondary, in uh, many applications, a little tiny bit of data loss doesn't matter too much. So if I lose like a few events uh, in many of their customer scenarios, it doesn't matter too much. Just I have to be able to keep on running. So the most, the most important goal here is actually to keep the data center up and running and not so much to prevent the latest mini tiny bit of data loss. And uh, the other disadvantage is that basically I have a complete uh, duplicated data center, uh, which usually might include up to somewhere around three to five nodes, but I'm not using those nodes for any performance gains for my users. Uh, if I had a hot, hot migration and double master setup, so if I could actually query both of them at the same time, uh, I could split up my user workload, for example, between those two data centers. As we're talking about uh, a RangoDB on Mesos and a RangoDB on DCOS, let's briefly talk about the replication between two data centers or the possibility of running DCOS slash Mesos across two data centers. So what actually works uh, rather well is to distribute agents across regions, across availability zones. What is a lot harder, so what I can easily set up is I have all my masters in one availability zone, and then I have uh, additional agents in different data centers. What's kind of a little more challenging to set up is to distribute the masters. And this is mainly due to, uh, uh, to the fact that uh, Zookeeper doesn't really handle uh, high latency uh, links very well. So what some people are doing, and uh, it works rather well, is to distribute them inside an availability zone in Amazon terms. So kind of near local, not too high latency uh, links, but kind of two fault domains. Um, but what we recommend not to do is to distribute the masters across uh, different regions. So, um, and you can also have uh, asynch asynchronous. So this is, would be the synchronous part because you basically just split up your cluster. The other part is actually to spin up uh, two, two clusters mm -hmm. and uh, makes them aware, which uh, there's ongoing work, but the current awareness only consists of that the two clusters know of each other and you can easily switch besides them. They actually, they wouldn't replicate any data. So for replicating data in today's world, you have those two options. You either you distribute uh, your nodes, so you distribute one cluster across two availability zones or you uh, add a proxy up front, which would actually duplicate all requests. So I've seen some people doing that, for example, for Marathon, uh, where they have a proxy in front of Marathon, which mm -hmm. is then distributing all queries to Marathons uh, to two data centers. All right, and this actually gives us time uh, for the demo. And the first thing I would like to show, my cluster isn't here is uh, simply a RangoDB up and running, and I spun up a new cluster. And as this is an EE cluster, it will tell us that it doesn't know the uh, certificate. And here we, we have an empty cluster. As a RangoDB is in the universe, Simply go here, install it. So right now the scheduler is coming up. And maybe one neat feature 
uh, which isn't enabled by default, but uh, we now, since two days ago, that's when they changed it, we can also deploy it in a UCR configuration. So, and what we installed right now, it's actually, it's using uh, the Docker containerizer, but we can also switch it uh, to use the Mesos containerizer, which is hard to see here. Okay. Our uh, main scheduler is up and running, and uh, right now the database and coordinator services uh, are coming up. And we'll have a look uh, what that means in just a second. That looks good. Let's see whether the UI not yet available. It's slow, but it's yeah, it's not healthy yet. So while it's still deploying, let me jump to the second part of the demo, and then we're just going to switch back uh, in terms of time. So uh, what I've done here before, or what they have done for me, is I set up two clusters. So this first one is being based in Paris, as we had two French keynote speakers today. Uh, and the second one is based in Vilnius. Uh, so there's the same cluster setup, they have the same user settings, and uh, they are linked to each other. So this, this is data center one. Let me actually create a collection. Uh, collection is this term uh, where it can then store documents. So in a traditional database, imagine it being like a, uh, a space uh, with multiple tables. And MesosCon, it should be of type uh, document. Let's give it two shorts. So here we are generating our, uh, should be up, yes, it's here. Now let's have a look uh, when it shows up here. It's already here, so uh, we were uh, too slow to switch over, uh, but uh, as you'll notice, if you put in more and more data, and you can just create a random document here. Key test. So I really create an empty document. Test. It's saved. See how quickly it shows up over here, already here. So this is basically syncing the data over from one data center to the other. And I believe, and this is why I find this important that also people are trying this out. This is going to be one of the challenges if we really, really want to support uh, fault tolerance across data centers. So. Uh, we've seen that uh, one of the first data stores to uh, provide that probably was Cassandra. But uh, over time, more and more services will have to provide that. And I believe this is something really relevant for, for us working with Mesos, that we care about it early. And this is why I like to see people experimenting uh, with these kind of options. Okay, I hope my, yes, my ArangoDB is green now. And now I also get the UI. And it's a similar UI as we just seen. The only uh, difference is that this is a community edition, but uh, still works for everything we want to show. The one feature, uh, I won't create another uh, collection right now, but what I really like about the integration into Mesos, it's uh, that I can actually scale up and scale down uh, from the UI. So this is a special Mesos UI, and we now look here at the resource utilization, and we scale up. So the easy part to scale up are the coordinators because they are stateless. So there's a third one coming up. And let's also scale up a database server, which probably will take a little longer after this is deployed. <coughs> 
a look at the resource utilization. Should go hopefully go up in a second. Yeah, we see the resource utilization going up. And if we look at the different tasks here, uh, yeah, it's already running there. Good. Now we have three up and running. Let's do something similar with the database servers. We're bringing up a new database server. That looks good. So right now it's uh, resharding the data. So uh, what will happen is as we're adding one more server, and this should actually be production ready. I mean, we don't have any data on there, so uh, it doesn't shouldn't take uh, too long. Yeah, and it's up there, but uh, it'll actually reshard the data when we bring it up. So it will take the existing data, which is on those two database servers, and will then distribute it uh, across uh, all servers. Now, and this is the fun part I wanted to show, is actually we're also able to scale down. Uh, so just briefly switching back here, we see there was another increase in resource utilization as we launched a new task. And now we can actually also scale down. And this will most likely even take longer. Uh, but I believe it's a really nice feature because it allows us to scale up and scale down in both directions. And uh, actually, um, we can try that as well. I won't be able to scale down to less than two servers because we have defined that we need to have two shards uh, for this one collection uh, we earlier created. Now we've scaled down and we also see here uh, the resources are freed again and can actually be used uh, by different tasks. Cool. All right. This was actually already the demo, and this lets me finish way too early. But at least it gives us some time for question. Sorry, it's not my talk. Uh, so uh, I probably uh, Max could have spent some more time on certain slides. Yeah, I, I can repeat the question. Uh, so, um, so what's the consistency model it uses? The consistency model. Oh, the consistency model. Uh, the consistency model, uh, they have a notion of a distributed transaction, but uh, by default, it's just going to be uh, persistent per agent. So you have a notion of atomicity um, per single um, key space, which is stored on a single server. Okay, thank you. Okay, behind no you, question. behind you, behind you. Oh, sorry. Um, I have a maybe weird question. <coughs> so you were talking about um, people building schedules and stuff like that, and that you want to see more people uh, develop stuff like this. Uh, so yeah. Okay, so my question is, um, how? So. Basically, ContainerCon was there, and we saw that, I mean, we can all kind of see that um, Kubernetes has a kind of a huge push from the community. So what is the um, mesospheres, if you will, or what is the Mesos community doing in that department regarding trying to kind of, you know, get the hold of people to actually build schedulers or... We, we th there were some oh. steps with the SDK, you know, mm -hmm. and okay, now it's a little bit easier, but it's still not dead simple if you I kind agree, of... Agree, agree. Yeah. Um, so what I believe over time, and this is also why I believe it's still hard with the SDK, and also um, talking to the outside, uh, it's probably hard for people external uh, or not collaborating with Mesosphere to use the SDK. What I l really enjoy seeing in the last months that we're adding more and more documentation, and actually there are a lot of community frameworks based on the SDK are coming up, and so I believe it will get easier over time. Um, 
what I like about Mesos is that that simply gives me the choice, right? If you say there's a lot of push around Kubernetes, uh, I can run Kubernetes then on top uh, because it's actually it's the application scheduler. And um, if I want to run uh, multiple Kubernetes clusters, Mesos enables me to do that. So, yeah. Um, no, I completely agree with that. I'm not, this yeah. is like not a tech yeah, question yeah, well at all. This is I'll like I'll 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 community. Yeah. I'll, I'll come to the community question. As this is uh, it's probably uh, relevant to me especially because I'm part of this community team. So um, I believe we, we are working on doing a better job there. Uh, but overall, I think it's a lot is uh, due to documentation. And this is actually where the community can help as well, uh, contributing documentation. Uh, as you mentioned, it's hard things. But I believe that in certain things, uh, Mesos is also taking the uh, professional aspect to certain things. So, um, for for example, some some default values or some very conservative values where uh, Kubernetes is more developer friendly. And sorry for taking up that example again, but uh, DCS basically chooses a way which will work in all distributed scenarios, whereas uh, Kubernetes is often or sometimes giving you choices uh, which make it easy to develop. But then if you really want to deploy it into production, it still makes it kind of harder. So what I believe is happening in the future, uh, we are working hard on making things easier, like with the SDK, uh, metrics API, and in my opinion, most importantly, adding documentation around things, how to do stuff. Um, whereas uh, Kubernetes, I've seen, for example, I was uh, just at Spark Summit uh, yesterday, and there was a talk about running a Spark on Kubernetes, and that was really, really hacky. Uh, and in my opinion, I can it co could count at least like three cases where that would probably fail in production uh, if those failure scenarios happened. And this is something I like about uh, Mesos, that in the Mesos world, we take this conservative approach, which is not that developer friendly, but uh, will work in the end in production. And I believe Mesos will work, uh, move towards uh, developers more, uh, or DCOS for that as well. And uh, Kubernetes will, in certain aspects, also become more complex. Whenever you start a greenfield project, it's usually easier. Did that kind of go in the direction you wanted? OK, I tried. And I'm happy to discuss that afterwards for longer. Then thank you very much. Thank and you. enjoy the last sessions from MesosCon, right?